as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. <clears throat> but different men often see the same subject in different lights, and therefore I hope that it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do opinions of a character very opposite to theirs. I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment of, to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we owe. To God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time, through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason toward my country, and of an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. <laughs> Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past, and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. <laughs> Is that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir, it will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourself how this gracious reception of our petition comports with these warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Our fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Have we known ourselves, shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Mm -hmm. Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, mm -hmm. sir, what means this martial array, if it purpose be not to force us to submission. Can gentlemen assign any other possible motives for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has not. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet us up to those chains the British ministry have been so long forging, and what have we to oppose to them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer on this subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, and it has been in all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find? Which have not been already exhausted. Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm, which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne, and have implored its inter interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted, our as have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt mm 
weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall it be stronger? Will it be next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of ineffectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us by hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak, but if we make a proper use of the means which the God of nature has placed in our power, three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, and who will rise up, friends, to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace. actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand here uh, we here idle? What is that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Or peace so sweet as to be purchased as the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, March 23rd, 1775. Following the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773, in which American colonists dumped 342 containers of tea into the Boston Harbor, the British Parliament enacted a series of acts in response to the rebellion in Massachusetts. In May 1774, General Thomas Gage, commander of all British military forces in the colonies, arrived in Boston, followed by the arrival of four regiments of British troops. The First Continental Congress met in the fall of 1774 in Philadelphia with 56 American delegates representing every colony except Georgia. On September 17th, the Congress declared its opposition to the repressive acts of Parliament, saying they are not to be obeyed, and also promoted the formation of local militia 